Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I am really thrilled today to be talking about a very important and fascinating issue with a uh, an all-star lineup of, of, of speakers today. Uh, the topic of today is the uh, federal privacy law bill, the, the finally um, a, a bill that seemingly has legs. It's gone further than most uh, other attempts. Uh, finally, a potential federal comprehensive privacy law. Um, it's called the American Data Privacy and Protection Act, the ADPA, uh, which always gets me a little bit confused because um, there's HIPAA with two A's and ADPA with two P's. Um, and everyone misspells HIPAA with two P's. This is going to make it even worse. Uh, and it's a whole reason just to reject this thing. But anyway, um, uh, I'd like to just do the briefest of brief introductions to our panelists today. And then so we can just get started right away. Um, so um, uh, we have Jody Westby of Global Cyber Risk. Um, she's been in this field uh for a, a very, very long time doing many uh, amazing things in privacy and security. Um, we have Alan Butler, um, who heads up the Electronic Privacy Information Center. Um, we have Alistair McTaggart, who is uh, really the, the one responsible for uh, the California law that really has sparked off this federal law. Uh, and he continues to uh, do work to promote that law and promote privacy rights in California. Now uh, we have Omer Tene, who um, uh, a, a professor uh, of, of privacy law, uh, also at the IPP and now at the uh, Goodwin firm. Um, and Susan Hintz, who is at the Hintz law firm, a, a boutique law firm on privacy uh, uh, that she runs with her husband, Mike Hintz. Um, and they are, um, uh, you know, really, they're, they're, they're actually getting <laughs> gigantic now um, uh, and has been in the field uh, doing a whole number of things for, for many years. So we have a really seasoned, experienced uh, group of people um, with a lot of different perspectives on the law. Uh, and so um, I, I'd like to begin by putting... Uh, a question, uh, initial question to you all, um, and, and just to bracket the preemption question, because I've written about preemption and debated uh, some folks here on preemption a, a lot on social media. Um, I want to put that aside and just look at the, um, just the bill itself. And substantively, um, how would you assess the bill? Um, what would you think about the bill. And, and I kind of want two grades. One grade would be graded on a curve. How does the ADPA stack up vis-a-vis -vis other comprehensive privacy laws that we see around the world? How does it compare to the GDPR? How does it compare to the state privacy laws, the California Consumer Privacy Act? Um, how does it stack up? And, and what would be its grade uh, in the class of privacy laws and why. Uh, and then the um, the other grade I I'm interested in is what's your take on the law on a more objective front? You know, is this law you know really going to make headway in improving privacy protection in this country? I is it really um, going to get the job done because we could say, you know, it, it might be really good as a privacy law, but not necessarily, you know, uh, you know, objectively uh, enough to, to, to handle that. I, I've given the the law a B plus. I, I think it does a lot of things well. I mean, it's surprising how many things it's got in it, a private right of action and a lot of the uh, components of the GDPR. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it does have a lot of stuff that I find, you know, encouraging. Uh, and when I look at it, I think, you know, it stacks up you know, fairly well to privacy laws around the world. Um, it's not quite as strong as the GDPR, but I think on the whole, I, I give it a, a pretty high grade, uh, especially for something coming out of, of, out of Congress. Um, 
objectively, um, I would would not give this a, as high a grade. Um, I would probably give it like a C, maybe even a C minus, because even the GDPR, I think, is not quite there yet. I think privacy law has a long way to go. And I think that, you know, we really are in the early days of figuring this all out. So I think that, you know, you know, will this improve privacy? Yes. Will this solve the problem? No. And it's a far away from solving the problem. So that's, that's my take on, on the law in, in general. So now I'll hand it over to um, uh, Jody. I'm curious what your thoughts are. Uh, you're on mute, Jody. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for inviting me to be on the panel. Um, I went a little lower than you. Uh, so for a grade on a curve, I gave it a B. I thought the uh, bill was pretty good considering, as you said, where we are at this point in time with Congress. But it, they made a complete mess of the private right of action, which they didn't need to do because we have the Privacy Act of 1974, which is the, applies to the federal government with a private right of action. They could have just sort of copied that, which has worked pretty well. And um, I thought they did a good job in getting rid of the sales share mess that comes along with the CCPA, CPRA. But um, I just gave it a B. Um, I, the second is from the objective view, I gave it a D. Um, because uh, the US is not in the driver's seat on this, the EU is. And we have to understand that and stop thinking that this is just for Americans. And so Congress should put forth a bill that would at least put us on the global stage and allow us to be a player. So I gave it a D for that. Alan, what do you think? Well, thanks for having me, Dan. Um, in our view, uh, on the first question, where we are right now in the substance of the bill, uh, what's possible in Congress? You know, in our view, this is a really good bill. I would say I give it an, an A minus. I think that there are a number of areas where you know it can tighten up some of the uh, exceptions, but it has you know, strong prohibitions on harmful business practices to actually stop the practices. It has data minimization rule. Uh, it has robust individual rights, protects against discrimination, and has a private right of action uh, on all fronts. I think where we are in Congress right now, it is a really good bill. I think objectively, um, we give it more of a C to B, depending on what you're comparing it with. Uh, there are a lot of things on our rubric uh, that we take points off for, for example, not addressing law enforcement access to data um, or not having, uh, uh, not creating an independent data protection authority at the federal level in the U.S. Um, and not providing for statutory damages and fully protecting against automated decision making. So there's areas to improve, um, certainly objectively, but I think where we are right now uh, in federal Congress, this is a really strong bill. Great, great. Um, uh, Alistair, your, your take. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me to be on the panel, uh, Dan. You know, I think I'm going to answer the second question first. Um, and not to be too predictable, but I actually think this is a real mistake. And I think it's a real, um, I think preemption is the central tenet of this bill. That's why we're here. Uh, this is tech industry's desperate attempt to neuter California. And I think it's a real Trojan horse. And I think all you have to do is ask yourself why we're approaching it this way, right? Why are we not going to tried and true, the GLBA, the FICRA, the uh, HIPAA route of saying we're gonna have a national privacy floor. And if this were just a national privacy floor, I would be shouting from the rooftop saying, great, you know, this is much better than, than nothing. But the reality is this is the tech industry's desperate attempt to get rid of the strong protections in California and replace it with a bill that is in some cases, there's some places things it does better, but there are many, many things it does much worse. And I, so that's where I look at it as a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. I mean, yes, it does do targeted advertising to kids. Yes, it does do the, 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 the do not call, you know, the do not kind of, uh, that, that registry, that's good for data brokers. And there are some things it does well, but there are plenty of things that it does much worse. I and mean, if you think about the fact that 40 million Americans right now have a privacy regime that cannot be weakened at a state level, just can't be, that we have a guaranteed funding. I mean, you'd have to give the FTC a hundred million dollars a year and in inflation adjusted, and then somehow have a provision in Congress that you could never make it go down. You can't do that in Congress, but in California, we have that. A standalone agency, service providers to governments that, that, are, that, are, that are exempt right now if ADPPA passes, 
And especially in a post row world, that's really scary for, for women who are now out there trying to make sure they can get access to reproductive health care. And if you're a service provider to a government under ADPPA, now all that data is off the table. Whereas right now under CPRA, you can say, I want to access, I want to delete it. I want to make sure that the government's not tracking me somehow. We just saw this morning that Facebook's message is being used to prosecute a teenager in, in, in uh, Nebraska for seeking abortion. I mean, these are this, this is our bill in CPRA is much stronger in many areas. Uh, and we should be in a world where we're saying it's a national privacy floor, not a ceiling. And so just ask yourself one question. If it's not all about preemption, then take it out. But of course, if you take it out, it won't pass because that's tech is that's the big text price for letting this thing pass. Thanks. Um, Omar. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for the invitation. I, I, I want to say that when you presented Alistair, you said that he, he was the catalyst, the motivator for uh, the CCPN CPRA, but I actually think Alistair was the catalyst for what we're talking about right now because ADPPA wouldn't have happened, we all know this, had it not been for California's law. And I'm not as cynical as Alistair. I don't think that this is just a ruse to sort of do away with California, but rather um, an opportunity to extend uh, protections in California. And I think beyond that, uh, to the other 49 states. So to your question um, of grading this on a curve, I actually give it an A just because the competition isn't that strong. I think uh, it's a better law than uh, GDPR. And I think it isn't even close to California or the other states. I, I think it's much uh, broader, deeper, stronger uh, than all of the existing state laws. Um, not on a curve, I have to say, I don't know how to do it. Like, I, I was a law professor like you, Dan, before this, and we only ever grade on a curve. Uh, I don't really you know, know how to grade something against some pie in the sky, which might or might, you know, not ever materialize. Uh, I think all in all, like Alan said, it's a pretty good law. I was actually surprised that we've come this far. I think it has a good balance between principles like data minimization, uh, civil rights, privacy by design, dark patterns, and operational issues like uh, privacy notices and algorithmic impact assessment, uh, global opt-out. It's called the unified opt-out mechanism in this law. Um, and uh, provisions on executive responsibility, which I think are very important. And like Hal Alan said, it has strong enforcement. It has a private right of action with some speed bumps, but it exists. And that's a game changer. California doesn't have that by and large. Uh, except for, you know, a very narrow uh, uh, cause of action on data breaches. Uh, it features a turbocharged FTC. The, the FTC currently is walking a very thin line um, with, uh, um, you know, very narrow legislative authority in this space, and this would give it a broad sort of uh, uh, sandbox to, uh, to play in. Uh, and also it keeps the uh, state attorneys general in the mix. So all in all, I think it's uh, it's a good law. Susan? You're on mute. I give any law that would uh, pass Congress, uh, any any a comprehensive federal privacy law, a, a plus, <laughs> uh, if it can pass, uh, you know, something's better than nothing. Uh, but uh, being a little bit more objective, uh, comparison, uh, comparing the law versus uh, other laws that are out there um, within the U.S., I'd say I give it an A-. Uh, I think it is uh, an overall improvement over what we see in the state laws. Uh, as compared to some of the other laws around the world, I'd say probably a B+. Um, and 
objectively, um, uh, because I'm a little bit of a hard grader, uh, <laughs> um, I, I tend to look at the things that are, uh, you know, you know, wrong with the law that I would like to improve, uh, regardless of what the law is. And so I'd, I'd give it a, probably a C plus. There's a, you know, quite a few gaps and holes and things that don't really reflect reality that I think could be improved. But um, again, if it if it's it, if it passes Congress, I give it an A plus. Let's you know, let's just get something passed. I've uh, been working on uh, some aspect of, of federal privacy law uh, with different organizations since 2005. I know people have been working on that earlier than that. And here we are, 2022. And I, we need this law more than, than we ever have. Uh, uh, Alistair, you mentioned you know, how scary it is for women right now. Um, I also feel the same way about uh, folks you know, um, with, uh, who are LGBTQ and, and, and their privacy issues. And we really need some some uh, some protections, some privacy protections immediately for these people. And I think we need to set aside some of our differences around these laws and not let um, perfection be the enemy of the good. Well, so the, the next question I'd like to do is drill down into um, a few things that you really like about the law, uh, specific things, and then a, a few specific things that you think are really problematic uh, about the law. So I'd like to kind of delve from general to get a little bit more specific. And I guess my my general take on 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 the law is like there are a lot of things I like. I like that it does have a lot of these elements that other other laws have, especially the GDPR. Um, uh, for a lot of them, though, there's there's always a catch, um, or it depends. So the private right of action, it 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 could be okay, but there's a lot of headwinds. It depends on whether or not you know companies will just you know put forced arbitration provisions in, or the Supreme Court and the courts will just reject most uh, claims because of this. What I think is is an absurd. Uh, interpretation of standing, uh, and then just kick out a lot of the claims. So it depends. It remains to be seen whether the private right of action is a viable private right of action, or if it's a really weak and and almost meaningless private right of action. And there are a lot of other, you know, the, the privacy impact assessments, maybe that's okay, but unlike California, which requires them to be submitted to the regulator, um, this law I don't think has that. So that it, it kind of could look good, but it could just be an exercise in paperwork that gets shoved in a drawer and no one ever really sees. Maybe. The FTC enforcement, I like that. Um, it still depends. Will Congress actually, you know, give the FTC what it needs to, to do things? I don't know. Um, so there's a lot of um, questions in my mind about the provisions that you know, beg the question, is this good? Maybe. It depends. It could go one way. It could go a different way. Uh, and we really don't know. Uh, so that that's, that's part of uh, a worry I have with, with this is that I could see a world where, you know, the optimist in me says, if everything works great and the FTC gets everything it needs and the private right of action really becomes viable and the law, you know, is updated over time and, uh, you know, basically, yeah, if, if I'm an optimist, then, yeah, I, I would love this. Uh, I'm more of a cynic. Uh, and so when I look at history, I, I see, you know, a lot of times, yeah, Congress has not kept the laws up to date, um, and this gets frozen in time, uh, and then we're stuck with a law that that isn't so uh, strong after a number of years, uh, and uh, that's that's a big concern. So I'm very ambivalent about the law because I, I would I, I would love for us to have a federal law, but we we actually still do have a federal privacy law. No one really gives it credit, but it's the FTC Act. We, you know, it is the functional equivalent of a law. It's very vague, like a constitutional-like provision, but it still is the functional equivalent of a national privacy law. So we have something. It's not like we don't have it. It just doesn't get any credit. Um, but anyway, um, I wanted to get your your thoughts on, on this. So I, I, I tend to be um, with the provisions or things I, I like, but I have to put an asterisk ne near, near most of them to say, I, I like if something were to develop in the way I would like, in the optimistic way, 
Um, but things I like could easily be things that I don't like if it develops in a different way. Um, so with that, um, how about, um, let's start with Alan this time. Thanks, Dan. Um, so uh, I'll get hyper-specific here. The thing I like personally most in this law is the specific prohibition on sensitive data collection and processing. This is 1022. And I think it's undersold what this law would actually do in effect, especially when you contrast it with other laws. This bill would require that any collection or processing of sensitive data, which is a, a broad range of categories in the bill, including uh, data about our online activities over time and across third party websites, uh, cannot be processed or collected unless it's strictly necessary either to provide us with a product or service or for uh, these specific enumerated purposes. And other bills, especially California, does not do this. In the California bill, you have a right to limit the use of your sensitive data. That's an opt out right, essentially, but it does not have a specific prohibition on category processing. And instead, the agency is going to have to rely on the general data minimization principle and enforcing that. So that's one thing I really like about the bill. The other thing, there's a, I think there's a lot to like in this bill, but another thing I'll point out uh, to contrast with uh, the way this bill is framed sometimes is enforcement in this bill is at three levels. You get enforcement through the FTC. Uh, you get enforcement by the state attorneys general and the state privacy agencies. There's an express provision in here that empowers California to give those authorities to the CPPA. And then third, you get the private right of action. Um, with acknowledging, Dan, the limits you mentioned, I think that that is broader and more powerful than any of the state bills that we've seen. The things I'd like to see in the bill, um, I'd like to uh, see the funding for the FTC, certainly. I think that's something that has to come uh, in the process or else it's not possible for to, them to do all the things that they need to do in this bill. Um, I think there's you know a number of small things that need to get tightened up uh, uh, and clarified that can still happen in the process. But I think big picture, um, I think it's important also to clarify the preemption section. I think there's a few areas where it's clear, I think it's pretty bit, pretty clear that things won't get preempted uh, because they're not covered in the bill, but that things like the kids design code bills that are being considered, uh, or even rules about limiting automated decision making um, are not covered by the bill, but uh, it's not always clear given the way the preemption provision works, uh, how that's gonna map onto new laws. Susan, what, what do you think? You're on mute again. The, the biggest thing I like uh, is that it covers people outside California. Um, so that's a vast improvement. Um, uh, there are many things I like here. The programmatic parts of it, I think, are, are a lot more in line with, you know, what uh, companies are already doing under GDPR and um, you know, extending those protections uh, to other individuals here in the United States is I think really important. Um, many companies choose to only apply those protections and uh, uh, you know, programs to people in the EU. And so extending that would be, uh, would be a, a huge benefit. So um, you know, love the you know, privacy by design. I love um, that there's a little bit of a more robo ro more robust, detailed uh, requirements around DPIAs. And then um, having a privacy officer is, is huge. Um, you know, you, you can't really accomplish a lot of these things without having, you know, the right personnel within your organization to actually lead these initiatives um, and lead them in a mean meaningful way. The way that they, um, you know, require that large data organizations have uh, uh, privacy officers that report at a very high level is very important and very significant and uh, something that's much needed and, and uh, across many organizations. And so that's a, that's a huge improvement uh, over, you know, existing uh, at least uh, U.S. laws right now. Um, I, I do like that they're, you know, creating a few more things uh, with the uh, FTC uh, I love the concept of a Bureau of Privacy. I want the t-shirt um, as soon as possible if this passes. And then um, the Office of Business Mentorship, I think is really, um, it is stuff that FTC already does, but to have that be a little more formally a requirement, the FTC is educating entities on what they're supposed to do and giving guidelines 
is so helpful. Um, a lot of companies just struggle and have a hard time understanding what it is they need to do. And given that this will cover small businesses and nonprofits who don't have the resources to, to do a lot of these things, uh, you know, they really are going to need this sort of guidance and 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 help and uh, getting that is going to be a, a very huge thing. I do think that the FTC is going to need some funding to do all this, you know, per Alan's uh, comments. And so that's something I think that is critical for us to have, um, although that is something perhaps that can also be addressed over time. Um, I don't know if we're going over the things that we hate uh, right now. <laughs> yeah, we can go, I mean, we can do kind of like the love hate uh, and then I curious, like on balance, the, the last one, then we can kind of just yeah. have a discussion. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, there's so many things to hate um, <laughs> that it's it's hard to pick just a, a couple. But um, one of the things that I I, I I found were some of the the, the holes, there was some Swiss cheese things going on in this law. So like, the exemption for publicly available data from cover data is um, much broader than CCPA and really undermine some of the good things you know around you know addressing data-driven discrimination um when we have these sort of you know big loopholes that that you can drive a truck through uh when it comes to ai so much of that data that's gathered is is gathered through publicly available means um i i think you know dan you you of all people know uh from from uh all of your writings and, and teachings and you've you've taught me yourself uh through a lot of your books I, you know how important it is to not think about privacy as just sort of you know something that happens within your private home, but also, you know, there should be an expectation of privacy even within public spaces, and even some of the courts have recognized that. And this sort of um, you know that exception I think is is huge, and then the sensitive information um, I do think that you know um, it's great the way that's being handled, but I noticed one thing that really um, I found a little disturbing was that in the last draft was the striking of sexual orientation from, from the definition of sensitive information. I think given, um, you know, what's been going on, uh, we really need to have, um, you know, a sensitive information cover, not just, um, you know, the, you know, sexual behaviors um, and activities, but also, you know, people's sexual identities. And so some people are fine with keep having that out there. Um, others are in, you know, situations where, that can be a meaningful threat to their um, to their lives and um, ability to um, function in the society, and so you know those are some of the things that I I, I don't like about it. Um, and then just there's a lot of weird um, preemptions, and you know uh, it felt like there's just a lot of sausage making a lot of things thrown in there that. Uh, I thought was really strange, like specifically excluding BIPA, but not any of the other biometric laws. Um, and it's just like, you know, it's like, uh, let's let's play some favorites here amongst the states. So um, the, the other thing is, you know, some of the absurdity around the preemptions, like, you know, it applies to nonprofits. It can apply to a Girl Scout troop, but it doesn't apply to banks. You know, <laughs> so I think there's some things like that that yeah, I just personally don't like, but all things that I'm happy to get over. So. Alistair? Great. Well, thanks. Uh, you know, there, I think I mentioned the things, the things that, that I think that does better, obviously the no targeted advertising to kids and the do not collect registry, I think is a good thing. We tried to get that done here uh, in a separate bill. It hasn't happened yet, but I think it will. Uh, and the fact that it's national and that in, in, in my ideal world, it would be a national privacy floor. All those things are, are good. You know, the, 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 the list of things that I don't think it does as well is, is really quite quite long. As I said earlier, the fact that you know, California law cannot be weakened in the legislature. Um, you know, CPRA allows you to opt out of automated decision-making, ADPP does not. CPRA allows consumers to opt out of profiling, uh, the national law would not. We, we appoint a chief privacy auditor and give that auditor audit powers to go into businesses to make sure they're complying. No such thing in the, in the, in the, in the national proposed legislation. Uh, you know, I think creating the standalone privacy agency um, and funding it with guaranteed funding. By the way, I think this is going to be very important for, for adequacy eventually. I think that California can make a really good case that we uh, would be adequate. You know, we have citizen regress, we have a whole bunch of things that, that are important for, uh, for adequacy. I don't think this, wouldn't, this would, would qualify ADPPA. As I said earlier, the fact that now service providers to governments, which are 
businesses under the under CPRA, subject to access deletion, do not sell requirements are now exempt entirely. In a world where governments are, are increasingly, if you, all you have to do is look at anything where they're buying information because it's easier and cheaper than going to court. So you have ICE buying, you know, uh, uh, location access for, for for people trying to track down people who are here illegally. That 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 kind of thing is terrifying, frankly. Uh, we we give citizens the right to figure out what's there, to delete it, to say don't sell it, and uh, you lose that under ADBPA. And California is what all lose that. Um, you know, under sensitive data, uh, sensitive data now excludes data that's acquired from surveillance cameras, from security cameras, from 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 photos. So now all of a sudden your geolocation, if you're going to that abortion clinic, if you were caught on a, on a surveillance camera, that's not part of your, that's not part of your sensitive data anymore. That, that to me, that just gives up the whole thing around sensitive, uh, uh, precise geolocation. Uh, covered data must include under CPRA, your derived data, your unique identifiers, it can include it under, CP, under, under ADPPA, um, allowing you to access all your data after January 1st, 2022 for the next forever. Whereas it's only the last two years under ADPPA. Um, I think one of the worst uh, 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 issues is around the non-retaliation. Under CPRA's non-retaliation, if you opt out of your sale, the business can't use unjust, usurious, coercive means to say to get you back in. That's gone from ADPPA. So let so just you're in the Safeway, and the catch-up is 50% more if you're the club card member. And if you're a member of the club card program, they say, well, we're going to sell your data. You have no choice. You have to be a member of the club card program, the loyalty program. But we actually say in CPRA, but if you want to be a member of that and opt out of the sale, they can't coerce you into it. They can't say, well, or the cell phone provider can't say, well, if you want us not to sell your geolocation data, the next are 50 bucks a month or 75 bucks a month, right? It has to be tied to, to, to something reasonable. That's gone in ADPPA, which means essentially that all retailers are going to force you into their loyalty programs. And there goes your, there goes your, 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 your ability to have some kind of privacy. Um, you know, and I think, uh, uh, so, I, I, you know, there's a lot not not to like in this. And again, it makes me sad that we're here because where we should be arguing, obviously preemption is my, my biggest one, we should all be saying, great, let's go for it. And again, I think that the BIFA com comment is, is perfect. If this is a political process, and obviously the subcommittee chair is from Illinois, so that, that one gets exempted, but California doesn't. And it's sad. I mean, you know, Epic's been arguing forever for for, for national floors, not 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 ceilings, and to not preempt state laws. And now all of a sudden, they're saying, "Well, let's just let's roll on on on, on California." Uh, this is a short term <laughs> potential gain for really long term pain. As long as you have a strong state law out there, that can be the sort of the the, the target. And and we should have strong pri privacy legislation. But if you don't have this national one, I'm you'll have more Colorados and more. Connecticut's, and I think just like with the Cal EPA and the Cal, um, uh, you, you know, with our with their clean air mandate, where you know New Jersey and New York and Massachusetts follow our car specifications, so essentially all the national manufacturers follow our car specifications. That'll happen with this. Look at Microsoft and Apple extended CCPA protections last time to the whole country. I think it's going to be untenable for these big companies to say we're giving rights to the Californians, but we're not going to give it to someone in Tennessee. So I think. If you if you don't uh, roll now and you and you keep the strong protections for one in eight Americans, that that will be the better thing to do going forward. Homer, thanks, Dan. Um, but I I really couldn't disagree more with Alistair here, and you know I'm kind of uh, sorry about it because I I really strongly agreed with Alistair when he talked about the California law. Um, I think what Alistair did right now, sort of debug uh, ADPPA, go section by section and do a comparison, we could do the same exercise to CCPA and CPRA, and they would prove faulty on many levels. I think they're far, far from perfect privacy laws. Um, and for the most part, it's what Alan said. This law has strong data minimization. It, it is an opt-in law for sensitive data. It has the civil rights, and California doesn't have any of these things. So I think just on these, you know, basic, this is the foundation, data minimization and sensitive data opt-in, uh, it really knocks uh, California out. 
Um, but, you know, be that as it may, I think, and I do think that this law provides stronger protections to the 40 million uh, California residents than CCPA, CPRA. But aside from that, you know, it's what Susan said. This law applies to 300 million other people outside of California. And with all due respect to California exceptionalism, it is part of the United States. And I think, you know, there are, to Alistair's point about uh, reproductive health and women's rights, there are women who sort of are concerned about protection of their information in other states. Uh, besides California, uh, and they should be, and this law would give some protection for, again, back to the sensitive data opt-in that uh, they don't currently have and that California doesn't uh, provide them. Uh, to the point that, you know, you would take this bargain without preemption, I, I think it's clear for her, every, a, anybody who's been watching this process for the past, you know, decades really, but certainly in the past few years, that such bargain doesn't exist. Like uh, preemption comes part and parcel with the federal privacy law. Um, you know, the idea you can argue for or against it, but the idea of having one standard for the nation in a law that's incredibly complex with dozens of definitions and nuances and, you know, some Swiss cheese elements, as Susan um, referred to them, um, it's not unreasonable to have a national standard. Now, Granted, you could perhaps think about sunsetting preemption in like 10 years. Uh, this law does allow, by the way, some carve outs uh, for state laws in the student privacy space and uh, biometric for, for BIPA and others. So there are some kind of islands of state innovation. Uh, but I, I, I think it's just not realistic to talk about the federal privacy law at this point without uh, uh, preemption. So, you know, we can do it, but that's essentially saying that we don't want a federal privacy law. Um, to your point, Dan, about the law ossifying and sort of becoming uh, detached from technological or business realities in a few years, I, I think that's true of any law. So, so I just don't see how, how different any law would be. And in fact, not just in privacy, we just had the big, you know, climate change package passed and we have laws on prescription medication like uh, all these laws are kind of true to the moment and what we do at least in this country is rely on uh, administrative agencies on courts to sort of keep them alive through uh, uh, different changes factual changes and I think for the most part like you noted in your piece on the common law of FTC enforcement actions and like Daniel Citron wrote uh, uh, with respect to the privacy policy making of state AGs, that has happened. So I don't see a reason to think it won't happen. Um, so, so this was kind of a response to what other people said. What I like most about this law is exactly like Susan. And by the way, I should preface my uh, 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 mm, mm, sort of uh, contribution to any panel by saying that I agree with everything Susan said. So I'll do it right <laughs> now. Uh, Susan is a mentor and she's a friend and uh, 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 she really, you know, she articulates it better than me. So what I like most about this law is that it exists. It's a bipartisan compromise, which is something mind blowing considering how complex it is and really hats off to the uh, staff of, of uh, uh, Chairman, w well, he was chairman, now ranking member Wicker and chairman, chair Chairwoman Cantwell also, who worked endless hours on this draft and on the House side, uh, uh, Chairman Pallone and um, ranking member McMorris Rogers. I think it's a tremendous achievement that they've been able to sort of stitch it together. Uh, it applies in all 50 states, it has data minimization, it has sensitive data opt-in, and it has civil rights. I think those are huge wins. What I like less is 
like Susan said, it reflects compromise, as these things do. So sometimes it's not as coherent. I think with respect to targeted advertising specifically, uh, there is some incoherence in the law. Like, is it opt-out? When is it opt-out? Uh, it depends on whether information were um, was collected for a, a different uh, a legitimate purpose, and whether there's browsing data there. It's just it's 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 a little uh, quirky that way. Um, and I think the line was also initially fuzzy between service providers and covered entities. It's a very important distinction, as we all know, in privacy laws around the world. Uh, but I think to a great extent, they fixed it in later draft. So those are my kind of pluses and minuses. Jody. Thank you. Um, it's very interesting uh, listening to you all. Um, on what I like about the bill was, uh, well, we need to have a federal law. We need that. It's what I'm hearing from clients that are largely global corporations, the state, the state action is driving them crazy. And so we need a federal law. I think we finally reached a point where that may happen. Um, the thing I, the few of the things that I really like ab about it is the data security provisions. As Dan mentioned, I've always been a big player in the cybersecurity space and the data security provisions are actually quite good and they apply to, to all organizations. And um, so I thought that was a, they're, they're much better than what's in California law. And I think that that is a plus. The business community has had its time, uh, 20 years time to get their act together and they haven't. So when the regulators come in and Congress comes in and says, you have to do these things, well, guess what? You know, you, you kind of deserve it. Um, so I really like section 208. Um, I like section 403 with the FTC and the state AGs sharing enforcement. I think that is a necessary compromise and the state AGs are going to have to have that authority uh, to keep them from, you know, all kinds of, I don't know, Dan, I, th I would think this is possible federalism lawsuits, but you know, um, we have the commerce clause, but the state AGs have a record of doing a very good job in protecting the people in their states and the US con government doesn't. So I think, uh, that giving them some authority is uh, an, an absolute necessary measure to try to see this through. Um, I'm really happy that the reference to sale and share is out of this bill and that third party doesn't include affiliate companies. If uh, you know, there's a reasonable expectation you'd share the information. I've had two companies that have affiliates that the information is shared. This has been a huge problem for them with C uh, where they've been aligning with CPRA. And so the, those are the good things that I really like about it. And it doesn't include employee data. I think that's helpful. Um, but on the don't like side, um, I really don't like that the FTC doesn't have clearly um, budget it doesn't have, I mean, they say they have to do technical compliance programs, issue guidelines, do rulemaking, do studies and reports, do look at um, a pro, uh, opt out for um, global privacy settings. They, they aren't going to do that without a sizable budget. Think about what the, if you look at the EU, what the EU commission, the European data protection board, um, the amount of money that goes into data protection on the EU side is huge. And if we want to be a global player, we have to get up there to the stage with an equal global player. And the FTC, I think, is the right place. Um, I'm not sure you have to eliminate the federal regulators and from enforcing on their industry sectors. I'm not sure that you have to, um, to do that. But certainly we need to have a, a government entity that is an enforcement. Um, but I have to have budget and money that can go with it. Um, I really um don't like the um the um private right of action in that um i think that it's just a mess with all of the requirements of what you have to do before uh you can even get to that point and it's um it's too bad because i think that's an important provision but it, it's just muddied up um the 
Uh, FTC setting guidelines on public or peer reviewed scientific historical data. This is like things that are that are outside of um, human subject research and institutional review boards. I've done a lot of work in that space looking at cybersecurity and is it, you know, human subject research. This can get really muddied up by people that don't know what they're doing. And so that makes me a little concerned about um, that provision. And I'm, I, I think the preemption problem is, is way unnecessary. Why list all of these types of laws that you're gonna preempt? Why can't you just say it's preempting any state law that conflicts with this? Or, you know, that would be equally applicable. And, um, and, and I think that's as, as much as it needs to go. Preempting all these other laws is, I think, unnecessary and it's creating a lot of industry angst. And, and it, you know, as Alan, you alluded to law enforcement access to data. I didn't read this as preempting ECPA, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, and I certainly wouldn't want this law to preempt ECPA. So I think the preemption uh, portion went way out of the bounds and what they needed to get into. Um, but it is a start. Um, Dan, you complained that that you think that the U.S. needs some room to innovate, that the U.S., but the, but the U.S. really can't innovate on laws like the EU can. We've, we've shown that. We can't do privacy. We just don't do it well. We're like the hairdresser that doesn't do their own hair. And so thinking that we have to allow room for the U.S. to innovate, yes, they're gonna, the laws get behind. They don't keep up with technology. They don't keep up with the threat environment. They don't keep up with companies' operations. But still, we need a federal law so that we can be on the global stage and that we can be a player and that we can um, begin having our companies have a, a privacy program that can apply to their operations wherever they do business. Thank you all. This is really interesting. And I'd like now to kind of have a, a chance to, I think, I think we know where everyone stands roughly on, on, you know, on balance, whether the, you know, you want the law to pass or not. I, I'm very, very torn. I mean, part of me really does want to see a federal law, but another part of me says we already have one. We do have the FTC Act. Um, you know, if we had a federal law in 2000, when the conversation first comes up, um, that law would be far weaker than what we would have today and, and would, would, would have hardly any of the things that this bill has. Even if we did the thing two or three years ago, the amount of time, uh, the amount of growth that privacy law has done in the past few years is phenomenal. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. And so kind of like, when do you want to take the bread out of the oven? Well, not when it's really getting good. Um, and I feel like it's just starting it, it, it and, and just the, what, what we would have seen just a couple of years ago versus now is, is tremendous. So do we really want to fix it now? Is, is this the time we want to stop? Now, maybe optimistically, this is a starting point for Congress. The optimist in me says, oh, this is this is going to be the start. And then Congress is going to uh, you know, ratchet up the protections over the years and we'll see uh, beautiful updates to this law and it's all going to be wonderful. I don't know. Um you know, in a sense, we're, we're kind of doing the law and then kicking away the ladder that got us to get to where we are, um, which is the, the threat of state legislation, especially California, which has been the real engine and the real leader in privacy in the United States. That and the FTC have been the leaders. And the FTC is great that they get to enforce this. But my other concern is you know, they're doing a lot with Section 5. Is this going to take all their resources and siphon them off from what they're already doing under Section 5 and then just put them on this law? Well, I'm not so sure that enforcing this law is, is going to be better if it's at the cost of all the Section 5 jurisprudence. So it, it doesn't say it, it preempts Section 5, but it, it could siphon off the FTC's resources unless they get a lot more. So a lot of these ifs, and I, I'm just wondering, is this really going to you know, ultimately lead to improvement? I think we're better. You know, we might be better off you know, I, you know, for, for not having a federal law. It, it's not so bad um, in the interim. A lot has grown in privacy. And a lot of companies are really following California and following, especially the big ones, and following the GDPR. So, so we, it's not like, like companies aren't doing PIAs now. They are. 
Uh, so a lot of the things that the law is requiring are already being done by a lot of companies. So can I, know, I go ahead. Dan, just to jump in, I, I, I actually would take the bread out of the oven when it really is good because it might burn later. And I, and I think, you know, it's surprising to me that a cynic like you is kind of assuming that things will only be get better and that, you know, two, three years hence, we'll have a much better privacy law. We, in fact, it might get diluted and we'll have a worse privacy law or no privacy law at all. I think this is um, a unique moment, an opportunity. And, you know, sometimes you seize opportunity, like the fact that stocks sort of appreciated in value for 10 years doesn't mean that you should wait two, three more years to cash out, like, because at some point the, the, they might they might crash. So, um, I, I'm just not convinced by the argument about timing. With respect to the uh, Section 5 comparison, I have to say, Dan, it's so far-fetched. I mean, to compare this law with all it does for privacy, you know, and individual rights to Section 5 of the FTC Act, which says that companies shouldn't uh, engage in unfair, deceptive trade practices, that, that, like, for me, you know, to even go into that comparison seriously is just mind-blowing. I think that they, they just, they're incomparable. This is much stronger than Section 5. Yeah, I think a lot of it depends on, you know, what, what your view of a strong law is or what, you know, you're, yeah, I'm, I'm skeptical of rights actually, you know, function. I think they're good to have in a law, but they don't, you know, do as much as people think they do. Um, but that, that aside, I, I do think Alan wants to, to jump in and talk a little bit about preemption because I think it's interesting um, uh, how the preemption works in the law. And Alan has some thoughts on, on that. Sure. Thanks, Dan. I mean, I want to respond to a few things related to preemption. You know, Alistair mentioned before that Epic has certainly uh, taken the position for many, many years, for over two decades, that, that Congress should set a federal floor. That's certainly what we want Congress to do. But we started, Dan, you started this conversation today by asking about this bill and what Congress might reasonably do right now. This bill sets strong protections. And importantly, it recognizes a identification by this cohort group in Congress that's been working on these proposals of finding some form of middle ground, right? So for a long time, uh, us and many others in civil society said federal floor or nothing. And the companies said federal ceiling or nothing, broad, ideally field preemption that would prevent states from doing anything. What this bill actually does in covering preemption is it sets the medium level of preemption that says if state law is substantially subsumed by the provisions of this law, then those provisions of state law are preempted. But any provisions not substantially subsumed are not, and it has a savings clause that saves specifically a bunch of categories, including important ones like facial recognition, um, you mentioned BIPA, uh, civil rights laws, general consumer protection laws. So it really is a place between the extremes of broad field preemption and only floor preemption. And I think that's really important to understand. It also doesn't preempt federal law to Jody's question. Alistair? I think um, what's interesting to me about this whole debate is somehow we've bought in or that a lot of people have bought into this notion of, oh, well, privacy is different. And unless we get federal preemption, it's not going to pass. And I look at, again, I come back to FICRA, GLBA, HIPAA. What about running hospitals or giving medical care is so much easier than tracking me for ad tech. What about, what about running a bank is so much easier? Those have national privacy floors, not ceilings. They let the states go further. California's gone further in those cases. This is just a, a, a mantra that tech wants to keep on repeating again and again and again. And, and the reality is we should not be willing to sacrifice these, these fundamental principles. Uh, despite what Ellie just said, this would subsume basically all of CPRA, except for the 150, which, which is exempted. We don't need to do this. And I, Daniel, I'm, I'm much more on your line of thinking that if you don't do anything, it's better to have strong, some strong state laws because over time that will that will gravitate towards more uh, more change and more protection. And think about ECPA. You know, still 40 years later, whatever, my stored communications over 180 days old are still subject to being searched without a warrant 
you, you can't update this federal law stuff. It's just, it's, it's frozen in time. And the, and the notion that we would willingly do this now, I, Omer, I couldn't disagree more. I feel like it is a, it is a very dangerous slope to, to start sacrificing these gains that, uh, that, that came and have only come because of the ballot process in California. If this was a small state, it couldn't have happened. If it, you know, wasn't, it was a very odd confluence of events that led us here. And I, I think the only reason we're talking right now is tech has finally realized, oh, wow, we got to get back to where we were. Then we're going to give all this regulation to FTC with no dollars. That's perfect. There's going to be no, there's going to be no enforcement because there's no resources. It's, it's, it's stunning to me that we would think this is a good, this is a good deal to make. Alistair, would you prefer to have had no ECPA? That's the question. Yes, maybe it's not perfect uh, 40 years since, but would it be better to have had no ECPA? I think, the, I think that the better thing is to think about data breach. California had the first one. It took, whatever, 18 years for all 50 states to have data breach laws. But guess what? They all have their own data breach laws, and the world still survives. You know, I, I just think this notion of privacy is different. We can't possibly have 50 different state laws of privacy because otherwise... Oh my goodness, Amazon won't be able to figure out what I want to buy before I want to buy it. And you know, the reality is no, that's not true. You can survive. They do it in all other sorts of areas of, of law. And, and what will actually happen, because you've seen it in the economy before, is big companies will adopt one standard, many states will adopt one standard. And it, so one state will say 45 days, you have to give me back my information, and one state will say 60 days. Okay. But the reality is the concepts aren't that much different. And maybe, you know, Jody, you don't like the share versus sell here. Okay, that's what's one way here and it's a little bit different here. And I'm not, I'm the first person to say that CPRA is not perfect at all. And that is why the California legislature with a simple majority can make any changes to CPRA to update it, to move it with time, as long as it doesn't hurt consumer privacy. So I just think that's a much better structure going forward for having these, if you want to have good privacy protection for, for, for America, and I actually think that the thing that's really going to drive it is California. I hope Ashkan Sultani, who's, who's the head of the agency, I hope he goes and gets adequacy from the EU because I, I'm convinced that uh, California it qualifies for it. And as we know, GDPR allows for uh, adequacy to a territory. And I think that will be a huge driver. And then people will say, well, we really got to get on this train here because we, as, 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 as others have said, this is not a U U.S. thing only, it's a world thing. And the EU is in the driver's seat. Alistair, Jody, you know, Jody, um, I want to get Jody in. Jody right. wants to, to respond to something uh, Alan said. Yeah, I, I do. And to, and to Alistair, one is the EU has showed us why preemption is needed. The data protection directive was a mess. I mean, it was just a mess. That's what drove GDPR was to get uh, a regulation that applied to all the countries. And we didn't have all those different country things to deal with. And we can't do this anymore. I mean, companies really can't do this anymore. And you're going to have the business community, I think, finally swallowing some of the things they've always opposed. But we have to have something that's going to allow us to play as a global business. And, and that can be small and mid-sized businesses today. But this thing with privacy compliance and what the U.S. states are doing is just out of step with time. And yes, Alistair, California's ahead, and I agree with you. It's more aligned with GDPR than, than anything else, and I applaud that because that helps. It's not perfect, but um, we, we have to get a federal standard. So I think preemption's got to be on the table. Um, that'll be a big driver, and I, as again, I go back to we have to stop thinking this centric U.S. view and look out on the horizon and think globally. And I, that's that's really where companies have moved. Uh, Alan, you wanted to respond quickly. I, I wanted to speak to to I think a thread that's coming through the conversation about where we are now. You know, this question of why now? Will it be better later? And also to Alistair's point about um, the the Prop Twenty Four um, floor provision, which I understand in California law, but the reality is that. Congress can at any time pass a preempting federal law. And we certainly would oppose any preempting federal law that we saw as weaker, uh, but we are one voice. And the trend we've seen in the states is we've seen a number of states passing new co comprehensive laws, many of them bad, many new proposals even worse. And there is a real possibility that in the coming years, as especially as California ratchets up its enforcement and becomes stronger under new regulations, 
that industry will push for weaker and weaker state laws across the country. They will rack up numbers and they will come back to Congress and they will say, look, six out of eight states that have comprehensive privacy laws have this lower standard. So set the set the bar there. So I do think that there is a cost to passing on the moment when Congress is focused on this issue. They're prepared in a bipartisan, bicameral way to set a strong privacy standard. I think there is a huge cost to turning that down and to essentially, as a broader privacy advocacy community, to say, no, thanks, we're not interested in the efforts of both parties in Congress to support a strong privacy standard. We've never seen that before. And the ballot initiative is a tremendous thing in California, but it's going to be weaponized by the companies as saying this isn't the result of the same process that the bill in, you know, pick it, pick it and choose Utah, Virginia, et cetera, went through. So I think that there's real risk to the status quo and there is a real benefit to setting a strong federal privacy standard through a bicameral bipartisan process. Susan? I couldn't agree more with what uh, Jody and Alan just uh, uh, expressed. And I just want to add on to that, that, um, you know, Alistair, you mentioned, you know, you know, we should let the states create their own comprehensive laws um, and, um, you know, you know, handle things in the way that we've done with data breaches. The the political issues and, and treatment of fundamental rights that privacy laws protect is not the same as, you know, protecting people from economic harm from data security breaches. And when we are seeing certain states not protect you know fundamental rights that frankly have had protections in the past and, and are undermining those i don't see how we are going to expect 50 states to pass laws that look just like california and also this is another reason why i think dan this is the right time because without some level of privacy protections in place um, I think our ability to, um, you know, express ourselves and, you know, have bodily autonomy and, you know, are going to be con continue to be undermined, in, particularly in, in many of these states. I don't know that we will have a federal government in a few years uh, with all, all those rights stripped that will allow us to even contemplate a privacy law of this type. I think we need to pass this now and... Um, Frankly, I'm I'm a little bit of a cynic about it passing, um, but I would love uh, for for the Congress to to prove me wrong about that. Um, now is the time. Um, we can't rely on the states to pass comprehensive privacy bills that are really going to get provide the fundamental protections, um, or really you know create an environment. So many of these requirements are so much more complex than simply sending out letters to individuals in a data breach. You know, they're very complex. A lot of the requirements that end up put, getting put into these laws, you know, um, yes, will protect some fundamental rights, but a lot of it is privacy theater that's just adding a lot of, you know, nonsense, you know, additions to what companies need to do are not really aimed at protecting people's privacy. Um, they're just giving us busy work to do, frankly, um, uh, which, you know, I appreciate as a uh, of an owner of a law firm uh, trying to employ many <laughs> privacy professionals, but uh, on a practical level, level um, you know, thinking about what's right for consumers and individuals and business and innovation, um, you know, I don't think we're focused on the right things all the times with these laws. Well, um, you you all have given us a lot to think about. I, I really am uh, so ambivalent and so torn, and a lot still depends on you know what some of these exceptions, how they pan out. You know, is, is the the public information, uh, publicly available information exception, is that going to undermine all the the good things that this does? Um, and, and, and other things, and or, or lack of funding of the FTC. It's easy, you know, like Congress could pass the law now, and then in the future, you know, the FTC just just doesn't get the funding it needs if the FTC starts enforcing in ways that you know, uh, you know those in power at the federal level don't like. Uh, and so then the FTC ultimately, you know, you know, get, get, things get weaker, or it could get stronger. Um, uh, it. It really is, uh, you know, trying to make a very, very hard balance and and, and prediction. Um, you know, the fact this law gets me in the middle. I'm almost I teeter in the middle a lot on, on what to think because I think you've raised some really interesting arguments on both sides of 
uh, of this. And I think there are some really hard costs and, and also some really great benefits. Uh, this is a really tough a really tough call. The other thing that I think we have to keep in mind is that the bill now is not necessarily going to be what it looks like if it passes. Um, you know, there's a still more uh, to come in the congressional process to grind down the law and and to 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 knock in more loopholes and exceptions that that could ultimately you know undermine the the, the law. So. You know, we're talking about the law as it is now. We also have to keep in mind that the law is also a moving target. Uh, and I don't know. I, I, I read different things about its likelihood of passage. Um, you know, some very pessimistic that it's not going to happen and others that are more optimistic. Uh, but uh, this has been our best chance to see something at the federal level in a long time. Uh, and I want to thank you all for a really fascinating conversation. I learned a lot, um, you know, and uh, I feel like I've been pushed and pulled in every which direction in my own thinking uh, on one side or the other, uh, and I'm still teetering uh, on, on this. Um, uh, but thank you all. Um, uh, we could go on for a lot longer, um, but I want to respect all of your time um, and uh, have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Dan. Thanks. It was a pleasure. Bye bye. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, everybody. Bye.